This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, fallout in the house. And it's all over allegations of bullying and harassment. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Ousted Liberal MHA Dale Kirby is going to have to apologize to the House of Assembly and go through some workplace training. That's the decision MHA's reached less than an hour ago as they debate the reports into Kirby and Eddie Joyce's behavior. The two members have both been under investigation for alleged bullying and harassment. And today, in a very heated debate, the House had to decide whether to accept the Legislative Standards Commissioner's reports about the incidents. Mr. Davis. We were exonerated by Reuben Tomlinson. There were no proven allegations of bullying and harassment. Please remember that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I asked myself, was it worth it? I asked my family, was it worth it? But not because I was any less certain of my complaint, but I started to question whether this pain, and I will say pain, because it certainly was painful and embarrassing and stressful, was it worth it? Ask one staff, just one. It just never happened. So this idea that this is a big part of the culture is just wrong. It's just absolutely wrong. During the past six months, I, along with my family, my closest friends, and my colleagues, have endured a great deal because I decided the behavior of some must change. Now, the debate went on for hours this afternoon. No, it certainly did. And we're going to come back to this story in about half an hour with some of the highlights of what happened today. Lots of political news today. The provincial government has released its fiscal update and the price of oil has come to the rescue. The deficit is down by $136 million. Here now's Carolyn Stokes joins us live now with more on this. So, Carolyn, the finance minister says this shows that the government is on the right track? Uh, yes, Anthony, except uh, the government really didn't have much to do with the defi deficit decrease. It's all thanks to one unstable source, oil prices. It's been higher than expected since the April budget, and that has fueled a spike in revenue. Well, it's all oil. <laughs> all we can say that the, the $130 million uh, is, is all based on oil. The provincial deficit has taken a downward turn from $683 million to $547 million. That's an improvement of $136 million over what was forecast in the spring budget. While we have not yet turned the corner, it is clearly in sight. The fluctuating price of Brent crude has seen a steady rise since April, well above the budget forecast of $63 a barrel. That alone has given government extra revenue, and the opposition is quick to point that out. Well, the status quo already what we've seen in the past three years. Uh, there's no real improvement here. Any improvement here is related to oil revenues. They've been lucky in the right place at the right time. The finance minister says the increased revenue makes government confident enough to revise its forecast for oil, increasing it to $74 a barrel. I still think that at $74 we are abundantly prudent. If we didn't increase and kept it at $63, people would be asking me today why we didn't increase it. So what does government plan to do with this year's oil windfall? Well, the minister says it's going towards paying down the province's deficit and debt. Oil is a volatile commodity, but if the bottom drops out of it, you know, we're putting it in the right place. We're not using that windfall to spend. We're putting it on debt. We're lowering the deficit. Uh, so we have the protection. He says some government spending was reined in. They found $5.7 million worth of efficiencies, but the group that represents businesses says that's not nearly enough. We can't control interest rates in this province. We can't control the price of oil. Um, all we can do is we can't really control too much with what's happening with Muskrat Falls. The, the, one of the only levers that government has left to pull, besides taxation, is, is spending reform, and we have yet to see that. Now, the finance minister also talked about what he calls the single biggest financial challenge this province faces, which of course is Muskrat Falls. The mega project makes up 30% of the province's $15 billion debt. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now. And stay tuned, as I said earlier, before Carolyn's report, lots of politics today, and uh, we'll have that a bit later on, uh, on the show.
But first, we'll have a look at our uh, mini weather forecast <laughs> for this part of the show, Ashley. And it was so nice today. No wind. No wind. Finally. <laughs> Finally. I know. It feels. Now, don't get used to it because uh -oh. it does look like <laughs> over the next seven days, uh, it's going to be quite I was windy. I say, you both have straight hair today, unlike <laughs> the uh, last couple of days. Yeah, so. yeah exactly. Uh, but yeah, it does look like it's going to get windy. We did see some cloud cover uh, move in today uh, through the afternoon, and that rain has started for the southwest coast and that will continue as we head through the night tonight. We can see that rain in there now that's going to continue to spread uh, along the province as we head through the night tonight, at least uh, for the island rather. And then uh, we do have all of that snow for most of the of Labrador. So we're looking at snowfall warnings for Lab City all the way through to Happy Valley Goose Bay and then in through Rigolette as well. Could see accumulation somewhere between 15 to 30 centimeters in some cases uh, along Eagle River as well through there. We could see some freezing rain through the day tomorrow and then we've got a wind warning in place for Port of Basque uh, rather for the wreck house uh, area gusts upwards of 100 kilometers per hour tonight. It's going to stay windy through the day tomorrow, but I'll have all those details coming up in a little bit. Tonight on CBC Investigates, we dig into a deal that's been a hot topic in the legislature. Questions concerning an agreement between Canopy Growth and a mystery company to lease the site of a cannabis production facility, one that's currently being built in St. John's. We now have some answers. Here now's Rob Antle breaks down the details. Shovels in the ground in May as Canopy Growth reveal where it will build a $55 million cannabis production facility in the White Hills area of St. John's, in a deal that could see Canopy get $40 million in reduced remittances to the province, an announcement that sparked debate here this past week. Who's leasing that property to Canopy? I don't know who owns the, the numbered company. Neither does Canopy. Officials say they are unsure of the shareholder structure of their landlord, saying it's a private business. But these Canopy Growth documents fill in some of the blanks of the lease deal. Canopy will spend $5 million a year over five years on lease costs, a total of $25 million. The number company got a $10 million interest-free construction loan. Canopy has an option to buy the land down the road, an option it bought for nearly $9 million in shares. Both Canopy and the number company are on the hook for portions of the construction costs. Back in the House of Assembly today, allegations that politics are playing a role. Is Canopy really just doing a pass-through of the $40 million of taxpayer money to a numbered company whose shareholders have liberal lobbyists but whose identities remain unknown? Good question. A quick denial from the government side. Mr. Speaker, the answer is no. Canopy says it picked the number company because it understands the local real estate market and provided the best value for money on a short turnaround time. The Canopy facility here is expected to be operational in 2019. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. Now, the identity of the person or people behind that numbered company that Rob Antle mentioned, well, that company stands to make $25 million over five years in the lease payments that it's going to get from Canopy Growth, and that company remains a secret. And I had some questions about that mysterious company this afternoon at the House of Assembly. As we move towards legalization, everybody involved in this on the retail side had to go through police checks, background checks. A numbered company, Hells Angels, organized crime is of no concern to you? Health Canada would be the determining factor here as to when somebody would get a license in a particular facility. They do those uh, checks and approvals to grant the license. So at that point, it would be the responsibility of the federal government to do so. So Health Canada knows who this numbered company is? The company itself is not... Um, when it comes to the company itself and the structure, we, the company is building a site or going through that particular process. So until the facility gets... No, but you said Health Canada is the one who's involved. So is there any government body that knows who this mysterious numbered company is or not? In order to get a license, to be a licensed facility, it has to be approved by Health Canada. So those that are involved in the facility would have those adequate checks put in place and those appropriate checks and balances. Okay, so Health Canada knows who these people are? 
I would not be able to confirm that. I, I can't speak for Health Canada. I can only speak for the provincial government. And what we have is we have a contract with Canopy Growth Corporation to build a production facility here and to create 145 jobs and to supply us with cannabis. So you have no concerns as to who's renting them the land because they're making some money off marijuana. Everybody else had to get police checks. So who are these people? I would say that uh, when it comes to any business in Newfoundland and Labrador, when we uh, get into a contract with the provincial government, we have a contract with the company, Canopy Growth Corporation, and they have to live up to the obligations within their particular contract. Now to the city of St. John's, they are going after parking meter hogs. Councillor Debbie Hanlon says people are taking advantage of the city's busted meters in the downtown by parking in spots for hours on end. City councillors voted last night to ticket drivers who park in those spots for longer than two and a half hours. Hanlon says retailers and restaurants are complaining because their customers can't find spots. And she has a message for all the people getting free long-term parking. Shame on them. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, I, no, shame on them. Sir, can you elaborate it? You brought it up that you were sort of shaming people. Can you elaborate what, what, you, what you said to council during the go-around? What I think is that people should be conscious of their neighbours and act in good faith. There are people down there, and I don't know what it's like to have my finger on the pulse. I've had businesses downtown, and sometimes you're in, in the doorway looking for customers, hoping they're going to come in. And if you look out and you see all, all the parking taken up, it's just unfair. Well, Christmas just got a little bit more expensive for parents in central and western Newfoundland. The papers there are charging a fee to have their children's Santa letters published. It's a huge tradition in a lot of households across Newfoundland and Cornerbrook as well. I'll find out what's going on.
Duke of Edinburgh Volunteer Hall of Fame Gala honors exceptional volunteers here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Join Fred Hutton and myself, Chrissy Holmes, on November the 15th for an evening of celebration and inspiration as we pay tribute to this year's newest inductees. For more information or to purchase tickets, you can always check out the website, volunteerhalloffame.ca. Weather update is brought to you by Harvey's Home Heating. Complete furnace replacement if yours cannot be repaired. That's furnace freedom. Visit harveyshomeheating.ca for more. Well, leaving the Confederation Building today, a busy day in politics. It struck me it's always nice to get out of there, but it was beautiful <laughs> outside. It was crisp. Yes. Very crisp, but not windy. No. Yeah, no, yeah. Not it windy. was a lovely uh, late fall, I guess you'd call it late, late fall, fall or mid fall, whatever. Uh, <laughs> winter, winterish kind of day, yeah. but very pleasant to be out. Yeah, a little bit of a chill in the air. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's not going to last very long. Mm -hmm. These cool temperatures by morning, depending on where oh, you yes, are, warm, right? way warmer. All so we're going to be up into the teens by the time the morning rolls around. If we take a look at the current temperatures, uh, two degrees for St. John's, single digits across the island. Island, three in Corner Brook, and then uh, we've got those cooler temperatures up through Labrador again. Mine is the uh, below zero for the most part. We're going to see those temperatures uh, stay around there as we head through the overnight tonight. But we do have that rain already making its way for the south coast. Uh, even some heavy rain at times right now just pushing through. And that will continue as we head through the night. You can see it pushing on for Buren as well. And that will continue to track further northeast uh, in towards the morning hours. And with that is where we're going to see that push of warm air. Uh, so most of the heaviest rainfall is still uh, making its way into New Brunswick right now, but that is what's on its way as we head through the night tonight. Now, as far as uh, future tracker weather goes, we've got all of that rain moving through. It's going to be snow for the most part for Labrador into the afternoon tomorrow. That's going to push through by the time the early morning hours roll around tomorrow for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then again, that uh, stronger or more rain pushing through the island into the afternoon, continuing to track for the east. Now, along between Happy Valley Goose Bay and the coast, we could see that risk of some freezing rain or even ice pellet mixture into the afternoon. So definitely keep that in mind. Otherwise, we're looking at about 10 centimeters of snow for Lab City tonight. Uh, by the time tomorrow morning, uh, minus three for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And here's those temperatures. Look, Port of Brask, 11 degrees by morning, 9 for Corner Brook, and that's going to continue to climb through the afternoon. And then eventually uh, we're going to see temperatures tonight around 1 degree for Grand Falls, Windsor, hovering around that for St. John's as well through the night. And then about 10 to 20 millimeters of rain on the way. Now into tomorrow, we are going to see most of that rainfall, but through the overnight, as I mentioned, between 20, 10 to 20 is the best bet uh, for the south coast and parts of the as well. Tomorrow is when most of that rain will fall and we could see somewhere between 30 to 50 millimeters for parts along the west coast, the south coast and parts of the Buren as well. Otherwise it's about 20 to 30 millimeters. So here's a look at the forecast for tomorrow. There's those temperatures, 12 degrees for Corner Brook, 14 for Grand Falls, Windsor. St. John should hit 15 degrees tomorrow. Uh, and then Cartwright looking at about 10 to 20 centimeters of snow and ice pellets into the afternoon. Uh, same thing for Happy Valley Goose Bay with 10 or 15 to 25 centimeters of snow on the way. Otherwise, uh, just rain for the southern half of the province. So here's a look at that snowfall warning. Again, Lab City all the way through to Rigolette. Cartwright not in that snowfall warning, but still going to see quite significant amounts. Then we've got uh, uh, from Makovic up through Nain as well, also probably going to see a snowfall warning through the day tomorrow. And then uh, we've got all of that snow, as I mentioned. So somewhere between 15 to 30 centimeters is a good bet by Thursday morning. So let's look at your forecast. We'll look a, a little bit further ahead coming up in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. Well, for some, corresponding with Santa is going to cost them this year. Two newspapers in the province are now charging $12 for every letter published addressed to old St. Nick. One mother says the price is too steep and it isn't in the spirit of Christmas. Here and I was calling Connors has more. An annual Christmas tradition is about to change. Newspapers like this one, the Western Star and Central Voice, are posting ads for parents telling them that they now have to pay $12 to have their children's photo and Santa letter published in the paper. It's a tradition to have letters and children's pictures in the paper leading up to Christmas. 
and then we would compile it into an email and send it off to the Western Star. Once they were printed, we would start looking at all the newspapers every day to find his letter, and once we found it, we would snip it out and laminate it and stick it on our fridge. But Drover, who sells children's toys, says the $12 fee is pricey. Announcing so quickly, so close to Christmas, and jumping from free to $12, it's a huge gap. And for parents who have multiple children, it's, it adds up a lot. Multiple children could mean almost 40 bucks for Santa letters. Drover thinks that's one less toy parents will buy this year. She's offering an alternative, a bound book of Santa letters. Parents can email her free of charge. And we are going to uh, print it and bind it and sell it to parents at the cost of a standard Saturday morning newspaper. As for the new $12 publishing fee at the local paper, will owners say it's just part of running a business? Well, Saltwater Publishing, that owns the newspapers like this one, says that they have to charge a fee to publish these Santa letters. And that's because things like ink, newsprint, and of course labor is quite expensive. They say that the $12 fee, well, they really don't make much money off of it. Actually, they barely break even. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Well, I know it's a tough time in the newspaper business, well, and I feel for indeed. our journalist friends in print, but $12? If you have four kids, it's $48? Yeah, yeah. it's tough. Yeah, 1-800-SCROOGE. Get your picture <laughs> in. Former Newfoundland Labrador Premier and Finance Minister Tom Marshall was at the Muskrat Falls Public Inquiry in St. John's today and he faced tough questions as well as suggestions that he and his finance department failed to thoroughly scrutinize the Muskrat Falls project before it was given the green light back in 2012. Mark Quinn reports. Tom Marshall says he did see the January 2012 information note from mid-level bureaucrats that was highlighted yesterday. It called for the project to be delayed for a year or two for further assessment. Marshall says he disagreed with that, adding there was pressure to provide the public with reliable power. This all started with, with us being told that there was a need for power and if we didn't get the power by a certain date that there were going to be outages. There were going to be outages, I think, by 2015. And if we didn't do something, you know, and we had the outages. People would be saying, you knew we were going to have outages. Why didn't you do something about it? Marshall was the finance minister when the project was sanctioned in December 2012. He and others did call for an independent financial analysis of the project before that. But he says the government chose to ask the PUB to do that instead. In the end, the Public Utilities Board filed an inconclusive report, saying it didn't have enough time and information to do a proper job. Again, Marshall said he didn't agree with an earlier decision to deny the PUB more time to make a decision on Muskrat Falls. It would have been better to allow the extension, but that was not the decision of the government. Lawyers at the inquiry didn't finish with Tom Marshall today. He's expected to face more questions tomorrow. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. First came forward with my complaint I knew this process was not a good fit. We were exonerated by Reuben Tomlinson. So, so don't give the impression that everybody in this house is saints, because we're not. Debating the harassment and bullying reports at the House of Assembly. We'll bring you the highlights of today's heated debate.
we join Joe Gowdy on his annual paddle down Labrador's Churchill River, an archival special at a special time, Sunday at 2 and Monday at 7. Well, a charged debate in the House of Assembly this afternoon as MHAs weighed in on the five reports into alleged bullying and harassment. Former Liberal MHAs Daley Cur Dale Kirby rather, and Eddie Joyce are both accused of bad behavior by their colleagues. Now, Kirby is going to have to go through some workplace training, and the Mevers haven't decided yet whether to reprimand Joyce. Here's some of the political fireworks from today. This legislation began back in May of this year. It was the only process that we had available to us. We are in uncharted waters with this investigation. It is now clear to me that this has to change. It has to be a much better process. The commissioner did the best that he could under the current guidelines. A process that allows for the names of those who wish to remain anonymous to be made public. Mr. Speaker, that's a flawed process. How would you feel if your name was out in public going across Canada? How would you feel? How would you feel if your name was put across, first of all, when the, when the complaints were made to the Premier, only three people knew. The opposition knew about it at 1.30 that afternoon. CBC announced it at 1.31 that afternoon, CBC. And now we know there's code names involved. How do you feel that your names are put out there, you're dismissed from Cabinet, you're told you're a big bully, you're told that everything you did, but it was two months later that the complaint was ever put in? Just think about it. Given what has transpired lately, how comfortable would anyone feel bringing forward an allegation of bullying and harassment right now? A truthful answer to that question, Mr. Speaker, alone is enough. I want to thank you all for that support that I have received throughout this entire process. I want to thank my family, my, my poor mother and, <laughs> and father. They, they've taken on a lot of stress through this as well. My sister. Um, but the people of my district, the strong district of Harbour Grace, Port Grave, Mr. Speaker, stand behind me and they show me that, res that respect and that support daily. The calls I've received, the message I've received on social media and, and email, I've even gotten calls from across our province from, from female officers in the RCMP. And so, by, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. The name calling, I, I, I'm accused of being a bully and a harasser but these documents are, one of them in particular, just full of name calling and just toxicity, just absolute toxicity. The animosity comes through and the hatred is all I could say it is. And that shocked me and that shocked my wife in particular because these accusers were just a few weeks before at my house. In the light of public comments that have been made by the member uh, since the uh, report was released by him. Um, there seems to be a sense of not understanding even why he has been found um, guilty of uh, going against number five or section five of the code of conduct. We all have to set the bar at an extremely high level for us as the elected officials that people put trust in, in not only engaging society and ensuring policies and procedures and, and actions are at the highest level, but that we all also have to be accountable for. And uh, I violated the uh, code of conduct and rightfully so admitted to that and uh, was reprimanded by this House and rightfully so. We need to have that accountability here. We owe it to ourselves to come forward to all members of this House and to, to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador and to heed the painful lessons of this experience and to use those lessons to set us on a course to establish a new higher standard for dealing with bullying and harassment in provincial politics. To Nova Scotia now, where allegations of discrimination by the Halifax Regional Police Department will now be investigated by Nova Scotia's Human Rights Commission. It's a case not about mistreatment based on ethnicity, race or gender, but an illness suffered by some of its own officers. Brett Ruskin has the details. 
Well, up to this point, we've been able to report that there have been complaints filed with the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission against the Halifax Regional Police. Now we can say that those complaints have not only been accepted by the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission, but there has been a recommendation that this matter proceeds directly to a public board of inquiry, essentially is fast tracked through the process to lead to this broad and detailed analysis of exactly how the Halifax Regional Police should be dealing with its officers who are diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, all of this stems from a series of allegations from at least two police officers last year, uh, Constable Mark Long and Detective Constable Debbie Carlton. They alleged that they were mistreated after doctors diagnosed them with PTSD, including having their pay cut and having to fight to have that pay reinstated. And so overall, again, this recommendation is being made by the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission staff to see if a board of inquiry is appropriate in this matter to have the Halifax Regional Police answer to these allegations of discrimination by its own officers. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. A nurse from this province is sharing her story of recovering from trauma. Lori Chaffee suffers from PTSD as a result of witnessing a frightening and horrific workplace incident. The murder of a co-worker followed by the suicide of the man who shot her. It unfolded in DeGraw in the port of port Peninsula back in March of 2012. The gunman entered a medical clinic where Chaffee worked. He shot and killed his estranged wife, receptionist Stephanie Chasson, and then he killed himself. Chaffee is in St. John's this week sharing her story. Today she sat down with St. John's Morning Show host Fred Hutton. Here is an excerpt from that interview with Chaffee explaining she was brushing her teeth when she heard the first gunshot. And so I was scared, afraid that I was probably going to die myself. And I could hear him roaming around the clinic yelling and screaming at her. And I heard him load the gun the third, second time and shot out again. And I could still hear him pacing around the clinic, yelling, and then I heard him reload the gun. And I, I was try strategically trying to think what I could do to survive if he come into where the bathroom was. And so I was crouched down thinking that if he come through the door, I could push him away. I had no other way out. There was no windows, no doors in the lower part of the clinic. Well, you can listen to Fred's powerful full interview with Laurie Chaffee tomorrow on CBC Radio's morning shows across the province. And we'll bring you more of her story tomorrow night on Here and Now. This is where the impossible happened. German guns were at the edge of this field. They're giving our boys a really hard time. Uh, we needed some volunteers to go up and take them out. So Matthew Brazel and our man Tommy Ricketts step forward. The tale of Newfoundland war hero Tommy Ricketts. As told from the Belgian battlefield where it all happened.
Welcome back, everyone. It has been called the war to end all wars. This Sunday, Remembrance Day, Canadians will take a moment to reflect on the events of the First World War. Well, each year we look back on the stories of courage and bravery of those who fought and died on the battlefield. And one story from this province pretty much captures bravery and courage, and that's the story of Newfoundlander Tommy Ricketts. His actions were so heroic that people are still working to honor him 100 years later. Last month, a ceremony was held in Conception Bay South. A peace park was created in Ricketts' memory. And politicians and members of the public gathered to pay tribute to the First World War soldier. Among them, his granddaughter, Catherine Sopel. There was a, a profound nationalism in Newfoundland and our boys, and they were boys, uh, were called for king and country and they left. They thought that it was going to be a short war. It was the end of the fishing season. It was something to do. Now, for those unfamiliar with his story, just who was Tommy Ricketts and what did he do to garner such attention and affection? Well, his story unfolded on a farm in Belgium back on October 14, 1918. And three years ago, CBC Newfoundland and Labrador produced a documentary that told the story of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment's role in the First World War, and that included Tommy Ricketts' actions. Here is part of that documentary, Trail of the Caribou, hosted by Alan Hawko and Mark Critch. This is the only caribou in Belgium. It marks the final advance of the Newfoundland Regiment before the end of the war in 1918. And very near here is the spot where Tommy Ricketts was awarded a medal that was not given to any other member of the Newfoundland Regiment. The highest recognition that the British Army could offer. The, the Victoria, Victoria Cross. Cross. This is where the impossible happened. German guns were at the edge of this field. They're giving our boys a really hard time. Uh, we needed some volunteers to go up and take them out. So Matthew Brazel and our man Tommy Ricketts stepped forward. The boys start advancing across the field in short 10 meter bursts. And Tommy is firing a Lewis gun from his hip. Now they're running and they got a load of gear. They get halfway across and Tommy decides, I got to drop some weight. We're not moving fast enough. So he leaves some ammo behind. They get about 100 yards away from the German guns when click, click, they run out of ammo. What are they going to do? They're pinned in by the Germans. Tommy says, you know what, I'll go back and get the ammo. Brazel covers him. Tommy runs the gauntlet, and every German gun is pointed at him. Somehow, miraculously, he isn't hit one. I mean, he doesn't have a scratch. He gets there, he grabs the ammo, then what does he do? He, he runs, runs back. back. Tommy does the gauntlet a second time. Some Germans are shooting at him at point blank, yet still, somehow, not a bullet hits Tommy Ricketts. He gets to the spot that they were, but Brazel's pushed forward, and he's all alone. Tommy does the only thing he can do. He loads the ammunition, he points the Lewis gun at the Germans, and he gives them hell. Finally, the Germans are like, all right, bye, all right, bye, enough, we surrender. That day, Tommy Ricketts single-handedly took five field guns, uh, four machine guns, and eight German prisoners. Tommy Ricketts signed up for the Newfoundland Regiment when he was only 15 years old. When he was just 17 years old, King George V pinned the Victoria Cross on his chest. As you could see there, yeah. the re reluctant war hero, he was so modest. Uh, when he came back to St. John's, he opened a pharmacy and he got an education which he didn't have before, right before. he went to the war, over to World War I. So he was very hard working and as I said, he established yeah. a pharmacy here and when he died, he was given a state funeral. Right. And like so many of the, of the people who were in the First World War, he came home, didn't want any attention. Mm -hmm. But there was one young reporter who managed to get a story out of him for the Evening Telegram, a, a certain young reporter by the name of uh, Joey Smallwood. Mm -hmm. Well, yesterday we brought you to Victoria Park in St. John's for the unveiling of 100 Faces. It's an art installation, as we told you by Morgan McDonald, and we showed you the faces because they are outstanding features, the bronzed faces of those whose ancestors served in the First World War. And one such descendant is Jeanette Jobson. And we're yeah, and she was the, uh, this, this is the story of her great uncle now, Gordon Bastow. My name is Jeanette Jobson. This was my great uncle, Gordon Clarence Bastow from St. John's. 
he missed out on the first, the major battle of the Somme at Beaumont Hamel, although his name is on the nominal roll call for that. It's likely that he was um, made, uh, he was either a reserve, uh, most likely, of additional men that weren't involved in the battle, but maybe have been sent in later in the day, later in that particular day. They went further north to uh, regroup after this major casualty at Beaumont Hamel and then were sent to, in October, were sent to the next battle in Guadalcourt in France. The Newfoundlanders were in the trenches at that point in early October and preparing for battle. The Germans did a surprise attack and there was a lot of heavy shelling and Gordon Master was killed in that shelling and his, his body was never found. For me to remember this, I think it's crucial. These were a group of very young people who were sent, almost sacrificed in many ways, to keep peace and to um, ensure that our country still remains safe. And it's so important to remember their story and what happened to them. October 24th, 1917. Dear Sir, as you are aware, my son Norman Trask has volunteered and he is only 16 years of age. I want you to please send him home as he went against his father and mother and besides, he is too young for that. He is a mere child. If he was older, I would not feel so bad over it, but I can't stand to see so young a boy go out into the world. Please do your best to put him back and send him home or to Grand Falls. Respectfully yours, Mr. Thomas Trask, Elliston, Bonavista Bay. Carbonier, November 22, 1915. Dear Sir, my girlfriend and myself are very anxious to join the Red Cross nurses. Only, we do not know anything about nursing. But we are more than anxious to learn and wonders if we could get the books to study ourselves with the intention of going to help the poor wounded soldiers whenever you think us fit. We are both healthy girls and nothing would give us greater pleasure than to nurse the wounded, if only we knew how. Hoping to hear from you at your earliest convenience, I remain yours truly, Annie Keogh, Box 125, Carbonier.
Welcome back once again. And Ashley, you were saying earlier, a big warm-up coming tomorrow. Yeah. Is it going to last? Mm, unfortunately not. So we've been seeing these warm-ups, you know, getting warm, then cooling down, then warming up and cooling down. And that's exactly what we're going to see. And then it doesn't look like we're going to see a warm-up, at least for the next week or so. If we take a look at uh, the forecast into uh, Wednesday night into Thursday, we're going to see that uh, rain continue for the most part along the uh, west coast. Uh, Wednesday night into Thursday morning and then eventually clear out, but the temperatures are going to drop. So we're going to see that change over to snow for the higher elevations uh, for parts of the northern peninsula and then stay as snow for Labrador. Things should taper off to flurries though into the afternoon on Thursday with the potential to see some clearing skies uh, for parts of the island into the overnight Thursday into Friday. So temperatures, as we mentioned, are going to drop down. Here's a look at that. About six degrees, between six and eight degrees for most of the island. And then again, we're going to see that rain uh, in that uh, onshore flow for parts of the west coast. Now up through the straits, rain will change over to snow as those temperatures will drop through the day. St. Anthony looking at about a high near six degrees on Thursday and then Cartwright uh, rain or snow as that temperature hovers around the two degree mark. And then for the rest of Labrador, things should stay as flurries. Now looking ahead even more uh, into the rest of or at least towards the weekend, we're going to see a little bit of a system move through Friday afternoon. So more rain on the way with some cloudy periods through the day before that that rain gets there and then some clearing skies. The next system moving in Saturday afternoon and with that it does look like another rain and wind event, but temperatures to start on Saturday are going to be quite cold, so we could see that first or at least some accumulating snow then it'll change over to rain uh, into the day on Sunday. But as you can see, uh, these lines, the isobars, the tighter they are together, the stronger the wind. So we are looking at another wind event Saturday night into Sunday afternoon, and then we should see some clearing into the rest of the day. So here's a look at uh, the five day forecast. Again, breezy conditions expected right through Friday, Saturday. The winds will pick up late day, and that's when we'll see that rain. But look at those temperatures down to the single digit six by the time Sunday rolls around. And then again, those windy conditions could see gusts upwards uh, early right now, but upwards of about 90, even 100 kilometers per hour. For Western Newfoundland, looks gray for the most part. Breezy conditions on Thursday. Temperatures dipping in the overnights close to the zero degree mark. Saturday and Sunday look breezy and windy. As I mentioned, about four degrees should be the afternoon highs in the single digits. And then for central Newfoundland, we're looking at windy conditions on Thursday, but that's sun peaking out. Friday looks sunny as well. And then uh, snow changing over to rain on Saturday and four degrees and then Sunday same thing and windy conditions expected and then we're going to uh, just see generally flurries for uh, Western Labrador before that snow moves in and same thing for Eastern Labrador. So let's look at your outlook. We will look at your weather photo coming up in a little bit. Thanks Ashley. Americans lined up early this morning to cast ballots in crucial midterm elections. Now, this vote is seen by many as a referendum on Donald Trump's presidency exactly two years after he and the Republicans swept into office and voter turnout is expected to be high. Long lines were reported at many polling stations across the United States and the number of advanced voters much more than usual for midterms, which were pretty wretched last time, 30 something percent, something like that. 33 million people had cast their ballots before polls even officially opened today. Up for grabs, 435 seats, all of them in the House of Representatives, and about a third of the Senate, as well as 36 governorships. The first polls close at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. So what do the U.S. midterms mean for Canada? Well, of course, it depends on the results of today's vote and how power shakes down in Washington. Here's Vasi Capellos, host of CBC's Power and Politics, to explain. There are three possible outcomes in the U.S. midterms. Right now, the Republicans control both the House and the Senate, so they could maintain that control. The second possibility, the Democrats could seize all of Congress. And the final possible outcome, what most pollsters are betting on, is that the Democrats take the House, but the Republicans keep control of the Senate. A split Congress could have big implications for Canada. First, there's trade. The new USMCA faces a congressional vote next year, and it needs majority support in both houses. The Democrats likely won't want to pass anything with President Trump's stamp on it, so they could block the deal. And then there's those tariffs Trump slapped on steel and aluminum coming from Canada. 
Trump has the final say on those, but a different congressional makeup could push back in different ways. Then there's the economy. The stock market historically performs worse under a split Congress. If you invest in U.S. equities, that's a risk. But there's also potential relief. The Republicans have suggested they're not done cutting taxes. Trump has already cut the federal corporate tax rate from 35 to 21 percent. That undercuts Canada's combined average corporate tax rate, which some business leaders say gives the U.S. a competitive edge. A split Congress could block more tax cuts and prevent that competitive gap from widening. Finally, there's the effect on the border, and Canada's now legal weed. Canadians who are in the marijuana business or who consume it risk being turned away at the border, even banned for life. A Democratic congressman has said he wants to fix that, and his party should be able to if they gain some control in Congress. It's my hope that as soon as the elections are over, we can sit down and talk about what is it that Homeland needs from us, Congress, to move forward on this issue. And that's why Canadians will be watching closely what happens in the U.S. on November 6th. And Canada has good reason to keep a close eye on today's election. The new Congress will decide whether to ratify the new trilateral trade deal known as the USMCA, the deal formerly known as NAFTA. And with that uncertainty still hanging in the air, the Prime Minister was interviewed by CNN and shared a rather interesting take on the Canada-U.S. relationship with host Poppy Harlow. You have called Canada a moose. That was your choice of animal, even-tempered and strong. So what's the United States right now? My father uh, gave a, sp a speech to a joint session of Congress back in the uh, late 70s mm -hmm. where he likened uh, Canada living by the United States uh, to like a mouse sleeping next to an elephant. Uh, no matter how even-tempered the beast, you react to every twitch and grunt. Mm -hmm. um, I said, you know what, I don't think of us as a mouse, I think of us as a moose. Okay. Uh, you know, large present, but still massively outweighed beside the elephant. Uh, we will continue to be uh, attentive to what's going on in the United States, um, but stand securely in our own, uh, our own strength and our own approach. In other news now, archaeologists in Quebec City are in a race against time to preserve a major discovery, a 325-year-old wooden fort built by French colonists. This palisade has been built 325 years ago, so uh, we're happy with this discovery. The wooden stockade was built to protect against the British Army. Archaeologists made the discovery last month when work was being done by a private building owner. The wood should have disintegrated over the centuries, but it was preserved thanks to the humid, humid environment where it was buried. Well, it's one of the biggest religious occasions in the world. And this week, many Canadians are celebrating the Hindu Festival of Lights. <laughs> Hockey fans of Vancouver are setting a pretty high bar there. This flash mob busted out their dance moves on the Canucks Diwali night. And there are many events being held across the country as Asian Canadians take part in this tradition. Diwali is typically held for five days in November. It's a national holiday in a dozen Asian countries. You want to give that a whirl, Debbie? <laughs> they look like they're having fun. They're synchronized. <laughs> hey. Bit of fun. <laughs> Well, look at this shot sent in uh, one of our viewer photos of the day. Any idea where that is? I think the snow well, kind of gives it away. Yes, obviously <laughs> it's north, but what part? And look at that uh, building there. Is that Just a cabin? A hidden cabin. Oh my goodness, that looks fabulous. Well, this place you can either boat in or snowmobile in, so I'll tell you where this is coming up in a little bit.
just a stunning shot there. Winter is definitely here for uh, Labrador. Mm -hmm. So, any idea? Not really. No. Uh, we had a sneak in commercials, yeah. Yeah. sneak peek. So, yeah. very cool name. <laughs> it is a cool name. Savvy Bite is where this is, just uh, about 60 kilometers north of Happy Valley Goose Bay. Just a gorgeous shot there. Thank you so much for sending that in, uh, Siobhan Brown. If you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to right. nlphotos at cbc.ca. I love that picture. Yeah. Pop in there, go ice fishing this winter. Uh, thanks for watching tonight, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Good night.